they raped her and abused her all night long and did not stop until morning. At dawn, the woman came and fell down at the door of the old man's house where her husband was. She was still there when daylight came. Her husband got up that morning and when he opened the door to go on his way, he found his concubine lying in front of the house with her hands reaching for the door. He said, get up, let's go. But there was no answer. So he put her body across the donkey and started on his way home. When he arrived, he went into the house and got a knife. He took his concubine's, concubine's body, cut it into 12 pieces and sent one piece to each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Everyone who saw it said, we had never heard of such a thing. Nothing like this has ever happened since the Israelites left Egypt. We have to do something about this. What will it be? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, we Thanks be to move God. on to Mark 5. Mark 5, under the heading, Jairus' daughter and the woman who touched Jesus' clothes. And we read from verse 25 to 35. There was a woman who had suffered terribly from severe bleeding for 12 years. Even though she had been treated by many doctors, she had spent all her money, but instead of getting better, she got worse all the time. She had heard about Jesus, so she came in the crowd behind him, saying to herself, if I could just touch his clothes, I will get well. She touched his cloak, and her bleeding stopped at once. And she had a feeling inside herself that she was healed of her trouble. At once, Jesus knew that power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? His disciples answered, You see how the people are crowding you? Why do you ask who touched you? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. The woman realized what had happened to her. So she came trembling with fear, knelt at his feet and told him the whole truth. Jesus said to her, my daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your trouble. While Jesus was saying this, some messengers came from Jairus's house and told him, your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher any longer? This is the word of the Lord. Thank Thanks God. be to God. Let us pray. Lord God, gracious and merciful, we praise you even this morning. We give you honor and we give you glory. Even as we remember those who have been cruelly suffering and beaten, killed, and dismembered at the hands of loved ones. We pray, Lord, that you will hear the cries of the woman, that you will see their blood spilled around over mountains and forests and in rivers. We pray for the children left orphans, Lord Jesus, to beg in the street, light of our life and lamp of our feet. Hear our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me take uh, this moment and this time, uh, friends and family, to wish you all a very good and blessed Women's Month. Let me especially say to women, Jesus is present for you wherever and whatever your circumstances, whatever you are feeling and whoever you are with, 
whatever your, 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 your circumstances, Jesus is calling and Jesus is present for you. Both the biblical stories or texts that we have read reminded me of a book edited by Musa Dube and Musimbi Kanyoro at the height of the HIV AIDS pandemic. The book was entitled Grant Me Justice. The reason for writing this book and the crying out for justice was that was so that I may live. Every woman who contributed in this book was that so that I may live. The Levite concubine story tells of a gruesome abuse of women deprived by cultural rules, by laws and norms of society from telling their story. They are denied identity by being kept nameless. So does the bleeding woman's story. And what we see from the two stories is that abuse knows no context. The suffering at the hands of the Levite is a, a suffering at the, in, inside the church. The Levites were, had special honor and role as representatives of Israel's firstborn who were saved by God at the Passover uh, Egypt. There were those who were identified as, as, uh, by God as those who are redeemed, the redeemed of the firstborns of Israel. So they represented the head of Israel and the households of Israel. They had a special responsibility of caring for the tabernacle with all its contents. One of the prime contents of the tabernacle was the Ark of God. Their function was symbolized in the ritual of cleansing and dedication of both the nation and the tabernacle. The movement of God's presence amongst the nation of Israel was, was carefully bestowed upon them. And wherever they were, they were known that the presence of God would be. Yet this woman, known only as a nameless and voiceless concubine, experienced extreme act of violence at the hands of a man of God. But suffering, abuse, and exploitation, exploitation was not only limited to ancient tribes and nations. Even in Jesus' times, the bleeding woman was cheated by those she trusted for healing. She lost everything, the story tells us, to doctors, but kept bleeding for 12 long years. She was separated from her family, her children. The, her children lost the, the love, the guidance, and the nature of her mother because of social rituals, because of social myths and taboos. Both women remain nameless in a story told by men in different contexts and the identity only that which is demeaning, the concubine of the Levite and the bleeding woman are the identities we hear of this woman. What names do perpetrators of violence give to victims and what labels that the identity stand for in society? Because we still have those women, even in the society as we are today. For the Levite concubine, there was no protection, not even at her own home. You see, she returned home, a place of refuge, and to her father, whose responsibility is to protect his protector and help in times of trouble. While we are given no reason why she returned home, one is tempted to believe that there was no love, peace, or happiness with the Levites. As a concubine, there was no matrimonial respect. There was no honor. There was no dignity for her because those were reserved for the wife of the Levite. She was a sexual object for the satisfaction of the Levite. She lived in a, a life of perpetual belittling and demeaning, like many women in our time experience at the hands of married sugar daddies and blessers. And many of those sugar daddies and blessers profess to be Christian. The Levite saw no reason to give her dignity of an identity and a voice, hence an object of exchange for his own life when the time come. Women as men property is seen, as seen in the concubine, is as handed by her father to the Levite, even as the father is not comfortable. If you read this chapter from the beginning, you'll hear how much the father, the father tried to keep the Levite from, from, from leaving. He kept on inviting him to stay on, like he was dreading the, the, the daughter's return to the Levite. The unfortunate thing is that we hear no conversation between the father and the daughter about her return or her, her return home. And we hear none between the father and the Levite about her daughter's complaint of abuse. 
the father, who was the only hope, sends her away from the safety of her home back to the abuser to be dehumanized, gang raped, while her husband is host and the servant securely sleep behind closed doors. Even today, women are encouraged to return to their abusers, uh, encouraged by their own families to return to abusive relationships. The police return them without protection because the story, their story either don't make sense or there is no physical evidence of any violence. Silencing victim and refusing to give them name silences other women too. The mother, there is no voice of the mother. The sisters, the aunt, the grandmother of this concubine, all are sworn to silence socially. She remains nameless and voiceless with no human dignity, even in death. We remember her today because she is the nameless woman that was um, spoken about in the story of the Bible. But what is the story? What is the reason for telling the story of horror, the ancient stories of horror? The telling of these stories, particularly of the ancient biblical stories, uh, uh, text of, of horror, as they are called, of which judges is also classified, is to raise our imagination to work against cultural and political, economic and sexual issues. This is so that humanity can recognize the, important of, the importance of unity and the value of intimacy, which holds the interdependence web of life. To be a life-giving part one to the other, what John Wesley called connection. The Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to die, to redeem, to restore the tarnished image and the broken image of God in us. As Christians, we are called. And I want us to remember this. We are called to take up our cross and join Jesus. Model in the resisting um, evil and injustice and to work for love for respect, for honor, and full human dignity. To lift all women, all people, particularly women who continue to be nameless and silenced even inside our own homes, in the church and society. Some are silenced by years of exploitation, camouflaged as, as assistance. On Wednesday last week, we heard that human trafficking often hide behind offers of lucrative works and jobs and help, and help to those unsuspecting poor and vulnerable. I want to challenge you to imagine the Levite concubine full story and make it your own. I want you to uh, imagine her mother's helplessness and make it your own. Imagine her father's painful regret and make it your own. But I also want to invite you to, to look at Jesus, to see him stop amidst his, his, his busy schedule. The, you know, as the readings, uh, capture neatly the hypocritical silence of society and particu particularly the church and its contribution in the many atrocities against the suffering of the press in many, many fronts. Jesus stopped at this day, at this time. The presiding bishop, Purut Malinga, said at the beginning of this campaign, enough of words and time for visible action. Jesus stopped at the touch of a nameless and voiceless abused woman. The touch, he touched, he said, asked the question, who touched my clothes? And even when he could not find this woman, he kept looking, he kept searching, he kept asking. Even when discouraged from looking further, he persevered until this embarrassed, shameful, and tumult woman came out of hiding. The Bible tells us that trembling with fear, she came and she fell at his feet and told him the whole story and the whole truth. She emerged. I imagine her emerging out of oblivion with a story of gross abuse, pain, and despair, armed only with hope in Jesus. Maybe she had heard Jesus' invitation, come to me, all you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know, we are told by feminists that stories express lived experience in local context. They reveal issues, real issues of joy and pain, issues of pain, of happiness and abuse, of freedom and oppression. We need to, lift, to, know, to learn how to lift the abused without misrepresenting their stories. Jesus stopped and listened to her story. 
But Jesus did not only do that. He also restored his dignity beyond healing. Firstly, Jesus reminded her of who she was. After listening to this sad story of this woman, she reminded her daughter of Abraham, an heir with Christ entitled to all the blessings and promises of God, the fullness of, of the image of God in her. She assured her that she deserved good health and well-being. Secondly, he affirmed her faith. Even after 12 years of losing everything, she kept hoping, she kept believing and seeking for healing. Like this, build, like this bleeding women, I want to say to all the abused, keep your faith because it is the substance of things you are hoping for. Thirdly, he restored her, he restored her to peace and freed her forever from suffering. You know, what I would like for you to know, each and every one of us, is that you might be the last person that someone who is abused comes to. You know, unlike the Levite concubine father, Jesus models a practical way he stopped to give attention, to restore the voice and identity of this invisible woman. He allowed her to tell her story without being scared because he was there. Jesus was saying to her, tell me, I am here. I am your protector. I am your help in times of trouble. In the middle of all these abusers, I am your God and I am your help. Abused people need somebody who can stand in their space, somebody who can stand against the bullies, somebody who can be there to give them a hand so that they can tell their story. The abused in our homes, Society and nation need someone to listen in order that they can be restored to human dignity and peace. The concubine, the Levite concubine suffered a great deal, but the story is a story of hope for us today. The story of the bleeding woman is a story of pain, yet it is uh, not supposed to be for women today. It is for you and me as a Christian community to stand up and know that amongst us there are those who are bleeding, to speak for them, to understand what they are saying, and to stand against the bullies. The Father was trusted, but Jesus Christ is the Father. He's one with the Father, and he is there to show us what fathers are supposed to be. I always ask men when I deal with them, why does God prefer to be called a man? Why is God's uh, uh, identity always associated with the maleness of humanity? It is because God is our help in times of trouble. It is because God is our restorer of dignity, is a restorer of peace. But it is because God would want for each and every one of us, and especially men, to change from their ways and become those who can be protectors, who can be partners, who can be lovers, and who can be compassionate presence in our lives. Let us pray. Love God, you hear every day the healing, the, the, the cries for healing for women in various places. You see the pain of the children left behind. You see society left in perversion of your laws. Agitate us, Lord. And settle our, 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 our comfort. Give us no peace until we know that we can stand with those who are abused, with those who are nameless, and with those who are, who are, who are silenced so that they can have their voice, they can have their identity, and the community, the people of God, the kingdom of God, can come into heaven. We pray this, Lord Jesus, hoping and trusting and knowing that you say whenever we ask in your name, we have already received. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> um, Mark will play our last uh, song, I have decided to follow Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can give us um, the, the, the right space to follow him, the right accompaniment and the right company to be with us. Let us follow him with as men and women. Let us follow his example. As with men and women, let us walk together with Jesus. He has come to restore the world and not to destroy it. Jesus.
Turning back, no turning back, there's no turning back. 